Good day, this is uh, Kiwi. Uh, this is my second online lecture in aid of uh, YWCA of Singapore. Today I'll be talking about the US dollar and, the, and its role as a reserve currency. Let me switch on to the share screen so that you can see what I'm doing. Okay, good morning again. Uh, We live in very uncertain times. Of course, I'm talking about the virus, which is affecting all of us all over the world. Other than that, there are unrest all over the world, especially in US cities. There's a backlash against racism. If we go to South America, people are suffering from uh, malnutrition. And if we go back two years or more than two years, we have this US-China trade war. This has uh, upset a lot of uh, trading nations. Uh, and of course, in the past few months, it has, the tempo has increased and it's affected the South China Sea. It's all tied up also to the unrest in Hong Kong, which has been going on for more than a year. And in the past few weeks, we are talking about the threat of the US dollar, Hong Kong dollar pack being broken. Hopefully it hasn't come to that yet. The question a lot of people ask is that all these troubles that we are experiencing, is it because of America, the big bully? In the next few minutes, I shall tell you my view of it. But before I do that, uh, please read this. We are all affected by the virus and as a consequence of it, we have to do our own social distancing. It has consequences. Restaurants have uh, less than full capacity. And of course, when uh, people are still staying at home to work, all this will affect the rentals of commercial properties and the prices of commercial properties. And of course, in, I think in the short term, they will all come down a bit. The way we learn and the way we gather to discuss things have all changed. The way we do our shopping has also changed quite dramatically. Um, but recently, there has been a development that I think will transform this even further. It is the way we make our payments. For a long time, there are basically three ways of paying for our goods and services, cash, credit card, or even the simple check. But in the past five to six years, there's been a major transformation happening, especially in China. Because in China in 2014, they started e-payments, which have become very, very popular. This is WeChat Pay and of course Alipay, these are the two biggest uh, e-payment systems in China. What are features of this e-payment system in China? Well, it's very popular. Like I said, uh, over 70% uh, of Chinese people use it. And the amount transacted is three times the GDP of China of 2019. Two months ago, something else appeared. And which is the digital yuan. China started testing its digital yuan. Well, what's the advantage of digital yuan compared to our e-payment systems now? Well, you don't need a bank account and all you need is just a smartphone. Let me show you how it works. Under the current system of e-payments, which is through our banks and all that, your salary is put into your bank account. You buy your smartphone, you install the web, the app, app and so you can transfer so-called your money or link your money to your smartphone. When you decide to buy something, you as consumer wants to pay the seller the money for it. So using your smartphone, 
the money is transferred from you, the consumer, to the seller. This is how current e-payment e system works. With a digital yuan, it's slightly different. You don't need the bank. Your salary is put into your mobile phone. Okay, and when you want to buy something, consumers, you buy something, all you do is using your handphone, transfer your digital yuan to the seller. And that's how it works. So the big difference is that the banking sector has been sidelined. What's the advantage of this digital yuan rule for Central Bank of China? Well, they have, of course, absolute control of the money supply. And of course, with this system, all those in the black market or those who are trying to launder money, they, will, they can be tracked. And so, of course, they won't like it. This digital yuan will transform our lives in, I believe, in many, many ways which we, many of us do not foresee. For instance, if we go back to 1994, this guy, Jeff Bezos, had this idea of selling books online. Of course, at the time, no one thought it was uh, a, 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 a popular idea because we all want to look, flip through the books before we buy. So buying books online seems to me, or to many people at that time, rather strange. Well, we have been proven wrong because in 2011, borders the bookshop closed because it couldn't compete with online booksellers. And online buying of books isn't restricted to books. It has gone beyond just books. It's gone into many other things. And of course, two months ago, J.C. Penney, which is a big retail shop, uh, went bankrupt because it couldn't compete with online sales of not only just books, everything else. Let's come back. How do we pass money to another person? Well, you just give them cash, that's one thing. But if your friends are overseas, you have, you have to use a middleman. Of course, we could use companies like Western Union that uses Telex and all that. But uh, that's been what we've been doing for many, many years. In 1973, another system appeared. It's called the SWIFT system. This one is, of course, far superior and more efficient than Telex, right? Let's say you have, you want to send account money to somebody else in another country. You go to your bank, your bank will message to SWIFT to say, please send the money to your friend in another country. So that's how the SWIFT system works. It is, of course, the monopoly today in this world. It is actually a cooperative base in Belgium. It's basically a messaging system. No money is transacted. You now you, uh, one bank will tell the other bank the message, and they will trans they will relay the money accordingly. So Swift is very efficient, very useful, and the whole world uses it. But it can also be used to hurt others. It can be used to sanction countries like Iran, North Korea, Syria, Russia, and Cuba. Okay, and it has been done in the past 20 years. Of course, those you, when you sanction, let's say, Iran, Iran is not the only country that's affected. All Iran's partnering countries are also affected, right? Iran sells oil to Europe, and so European nations are also affected. 18% of Iran's uh, uh, exports uh, go to Europe. So the Europeans are not happy with these sanctions by the US government against Iran. In the past many years, they've been trying to create their own system. Europe, they're still developing their target too. Over in China and Russia, they're also coming up with their own. Russia is coming up with their SPFS and China is coming up with their CIPS system. These are coming up on stream, not very popular yet. Okay, now the question we ask is, why is the US able to impose such sanctions on everyone, the whole world? Well, there's only one reason for that. Well, we all know that the US dollar is dominant. You know, you look at this chart, it shows that all the banks of the world, about 62% of our foreign reserves are in US dollars. 
that shows the dominance of US dollar. And all about 40% of all transactions in the international payment system like SWIFT is all US dollars. Okay. In fact, the global trading currency is about three or five trillion dollars a day and it's mostly US dollar based. The fact that the world has globalized since the Second World War adds to the dominance of US dollar because everybody is easier to pay goods and services using just one currency. And that has made the US dollar more dominant over the past 70 years. So since 1945, or some people might say 1913, the US has been the superpower of the world. And uh, what underlies their superpower status? It is the US dollar. The US dollar is not just another currency. It is a reserve currency, which is very important. If you look back at history, there have been many, many reserve currencies. Go back to the Romans, and of course the last uh, person who handled it was the British uh, Empire, right to the, what some would say 1913, okay, before the US dollar became the dominant currency. What's the advantage of being the reserve currency? Well, for American consumers and businessmen, no currency conversion. They can sell bonds in price in US dollar, and they can run huge trade deficits. The birth of the current system is actually can be traced back to Bretton's, Bretton Woods. This is after the Second World War, or just before the end. And when all the great powers came together and decided that uh, we will have a new monetary system. Okay? And it's very simple. It's based on gold. Okay? For every ounce of gold, 35 US dollars will back it. All other currencies of the world will be packed to the US dollar. Okay, So if you hold British sterling pounds, you want to change your money into gold, you have to buy US dollars first and then you change to gold. You cannot, you cannot uh, go around the US dollar. So the trust is this, that the US government will not print extra US dollars unless they have extra gold. So that's the system. But unfortunately, the US government didn't keep to that principle. And throughout the 60s, they started to print more dollars than they had gold because they had expensive wars to wage in Vietnam. And of course, when Lyndon Johnson became the president, he wanted to upgrade American society, you know, uh, introduce a great welfare society to the Americans. After all, they are the biggest and most wealthy nation in the world. Why not? And so all this costs money. And what did they do? They just printed more US dollars to pay for all this. Very soon, a lot of the central banks of the world, Japan, European Central Bank, realized that, hey, the US banking is actually printing a lot more dollars than they have gold. So what they did was they used the US dollars they have, they swapped it for gold. And so throughout the 60s, a lot of the gold flowed out of the US system. How much? Well, this chart shows you. In 1949, just after the, the war, the US had 21,000 tons of gold, which is 60% of the world's Central banks were gold. But in the, throughout the 60s and early 70s, right, they've been, uh, a lot of the European banks and, and Japanese banks have been swapping their US dollars on gold. So in that period, it dropped about 12,000 tons of gold. Okay? So the US whole of gold has shrunk from 60% to 26% by 1975. No, all this outflow of gold agitated the U.S. administration. So in 1971, August, Nixon came out to say, sorry, all the U.S. dollars you have, you can no longer change it to gold at $35 an ounce. So in a sense, the world was cheated by this announcement. So that means what backs money since 1971? Basically nothing. 
every central bank can print as, as much money as they wish. So the exchange rate of a currency will de depend on the demand and supply. So that's what we have since 1971. So in response to this, um, wait, if I go both near that, let's look at the advantages of the fiat or paper money. Because the supply of gold is limited, it is very difficult for central banks to manage the economy, especially when there's a recession. And during a recession, central banks would like to print more money to stimulate the economy. If you're under a gold standard, you can't do that. Okay? Of course, the main disadvantage of having a paper money system is that central banks will just overprint. And if you look at history, it has always happened, 100% of the time. The US government is no different. And you can see that the US dollar has weakened in purchasing power since 1913. One dollar in 1913 is equivalent to three cents today. So you can imagine the, the plunge in your purchasing power, the US dollar since about 100 years ago. Okay, what up happened after the Nixon shock in August 1971? Well, exchange rates will be determined by demand and supply, right? So what happened was the whole decided, I don't want to hold on the US dollars anymore, and they all dumped the US dollar. So this is the yen versus dollar graph since 1971. So as you can see, the yen strengthened from 350 yen per dollar to about 200 yen per dollar. So this is the yen strengthening or the dollar weakening. Now, the US government didn't like it because everyone is dump was dumping their US dollar. So how do you get people to want to hold US dollars? They thought about it and the solution was simple. Link the US dollar to oil. So what they did was in 1974, they went to Saudi Arabia and had a bargain with Saudi Arabia. And since Saudi Arabia was the, was the, the big uh, guy in OPEC, the arrangement was this, please get OPEC to sell all your oil in US dollars only. In return, the US government will protect the house of Saud and you will be ensured security and your longevity. So Saudi Arabia, did, Saudi Arabia agreed to that. And that's how we got what we call now the petrol dollar system. So the beauty of this petrol dollar system is every time, even if you're from China, Singapore, you want to buy oil, you have to use your local currency, change it to US dollar before you can buy oil. So every day, there's always a demand for US dollar. So at a stroke, global demand for dollars came into effect. Right now, today, well, if you don't buy oil, most of the oil will be sold in uh, Chicago and uh, London, and all will be priced in US dollars. On top of that, how to increase the demand for US dollar one notch further? Well, you price all raw materials in US dollars, you conduct international trade in US dollars, you sort of encourage or enforce your na nations to keep all their reserve currencies in US dollars. And that's what they've been doing for the past 70 years, rather successfully. Just now I mentioned about all the advantages of being a reserve currency. There's one more, which I want to emphasize again. The US can print money free of charge. Okay, this is very important because when the US waged war in Afghanistan and Iraq, costing over $3 trillion, you know, or when they have to pay for 800 military bases all over the world, how do you pay them? Simple. You just print money. And in a sense, many believe that this is how the US empire controls the world, through the US dollars. Who dares to challenge the dominance of US dollars? Okay, well, 20 years ago, Saddam Hussein wanted to do that. He wanted to sell oil for euros. To him, it was logical. I mean, why would his customers are all Europeans? Why would he want to change uh, to US dollars before selling his oil to European customers? But of course, that, that was undermining the US petrol dollar system. Within three years, he was gone. Bye-bye. 
Colonel Gaddafi tried to do that as well in 2009. He came up with this idea of a gold dinner to get the oil producing countries to sell oil for gold. Within two years, he was gone. And there are a few other examples. But of course, we've been told by everyone, uh, the US media that, oh, these two uh, autocrats have to go because they were not practicing democracy and human rights. This is what we have been told. But of course, we know this is, the truth is very different. Now, China is coming up. It is now maybe the second biggest or maybe even the biggest economy in the world. Okay, Soon, it will want to use the renminbi as a reserve currency. But how do you avoid the fates of people like Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi? Now, like I said before, you look at history, all money systems will collapse. First, we come with hard money. Then we have paper money, which is linked to hard money. This is the Bretton Woods system. It's between 1945 and now. And of course, um, we have the current system, system now, which is a fiat money, 1971 to now. And of course, the, the third and last stage will be the collapse of the fiat currency. And many people think that that is where we are now. So China is, in a sense, preparing for a new gold standard. So what does the gold standard mean? You must collect, accumulate gold. And so China has been buying lots of gold in the past 10, 20 years, especially the past 20, 10 years. You look at this chart from one of those gold bug newsletters. Um, China is now actually the world's biggest producer of gold, but none of it is exported. So the blue lines show the production of gold by China since like 20 years ago. It's a pink one. China is importing lots of gold as well. And they've been actively buying gold for past 10 over years. Today, the official gold holdings, right? I mean, the holdings that all countries declare, China is supposed to have to about 2,000 tons of gold, and the US has 8,000 tons of gold. But now many people think that this is not the true situation. It could, the US may not have so much gold. Why? This suspicion was raised about seven years ago uh, when uh, Bundesbank, Bundesbank has got about 3,400 tons of gold. And because of the Cold War, they kept all the gold outside Germany. Okay. In January 2013, Bundesbank told Bank of France and the, the US government that um, I want back some of my gold, 374 tons from France and 300 tons from the USA. The reply from the US government was that, okay, we will return you your gold, but give us seven years to return your gold. Seven years to return 300 tons of gold? That's that a lot of people thinking, why do you need seven years to return 300 tons of gold? You could just hire three cargo planes and send it back to Germany within a month or two. Why? So the speculation at the time was that maybe, okay, now, all the gold in the US, or most of it anyway, is kept in Fort Knox. So the su suspicion was that maybe there's no more gold in Fort Knox. Okay, maybe Fort Knox is empty. So the question is, why wouldn't there be any gold in Fort Knox? Well, there's a good reason. For many years, for past 30, 40 years, all the central banks of the world have been thinking, why do we need to keep all our gold in our vaults? Gold doesn't pay any dividends, pays nothing. So some of them decide to sell them, like Britain under Gordon Brown. In the year, 20 years ago, he decided to sell half of Britain's gold reserve, which is about 400 tons. And he sold it at 282 US dollars an ounce. Ouch, you can say that. 
But now looking back, of course, that was a mistake. But at that time, it was perfectly rational because gold doesn't pay anything. So Gordon Brown changed all half of Britain's gold reserves into other uh, assets that yield returns. Other central banks didn't sell their gold. What they did was they lease it out. Okay, so the arrangement was this. They tell the investment banks, look, I got 300 tons of gold. I'll lease it to you for five or 10 years. All you do is just maybe pay me one, 2% per annum for leasing my gold. At the end of five or 10 years, please return my gold back to me. So why not? Investment banks felt it was a good move as well because here I'm borrowing tons and tons of gold and uh, for maybe a small interest like one, two percent. And in return, what, you know, all I do is I will sell the gold in the open market. With the money raised, I can use it to expand my business. And that's what they did. Okay, But one crucial part of this arrangement is that you must keep the price of gold down. Because if the price of gold goes up, then those who have borrowed the gold will be in trouble. And so the whole global gold trading system is saw, in a sense, a lot of people believe, geared to us is to hold down the price of gold. Look at this, the price of gold throughout the 80s, right before the uh, mortgage crisis in 2009, gold was kept within a tight range. But since then, of course, it has gone up. Then it came down again, it was quite well controlled uh, a few years ago until the past year or two is beginning to pick up again. Now, all the gold, most of the gold trading in this world is actually based on paper gold. In fact, some people say like 10 to 20 times of all gold trading, there's only one, one portion of it is real gold. So it's all paper gold trading. One way of countering this, okay, before I go to that, so if the central banks have leased out their gold, that's all right. But there are some central banks who have sold their gold. And so it's been estimated that, or speculated rather, that why is it the US took seven or six years to return Germany's gold? So the speculation is that maybe the US hasn't got 8,000 tons of gold, much less than that. And China, because of all these imports and mining the past 10, 20 years, has got 20,000 tons of gold. What else can China do or must do? Well, in 2016, it started the Shanghai Gold Exchange in Renminbi. Okay? That means if you want to buy or sell gold in China, you must deliver your gold or after paying for gold, you must take delivery of the gold. That's the big difference between the Shanghai Gold Exchange and the two major gold exchanges in the US and Britain. The next step for China is to undermine the US dollar. In, in a sense, establish a petrol yuan system. Two years ago, China launches yuan oil futures. That means now you can buy or sell oil in renminbi. Saddam Hussein did that in two, year 2000, he was deposed. I suppose China is too big to be deposed, so they were left alone. I mean, popularity for this yuan oil futures hasn't challenged the uh, US and Britain yet. It's about still about 11% of all global trade in oil. But give them time, in time to come, more and more people might want to uh, buy oil in yuan. The other steps, well, the, China has persuaded Iran to sell oil, Russia has also to sell their oil in yuan. And of course, China is trying to move away by accumulating less US dollars in their coffers. These are the oil, top oil producing countries, right? The, the, of course, the aim is to get most of these countries to start buying and selling oil in renminbi. The, China's biggest hurdle, right, uh, is Saudi Arabia. Because actually China is the biggest importer of oil from Saudi Arabia. And for Saudi Arabia, China is its biggest customer. So it stands to reason that China wants to buy oil in 
Renminbi be or Yuan. But unfortunately, unfortunately, China hasn't been successful yet uh, to convince Saudi Arabia to sell their oil in uh, Renminbi because uh, MBS and Trump are still the best of friends. But if they do, if all the OPEC countries start selling uh, oil in Renminbi, there are clear uh, advantages of doing that. See, right now, they buy oil, they, they sell oil, they get US dollars. Okay? If they sell oil to China, they get renminbi. But with renminbi, you can go to the Shanghai Gold Exchange and change it to gold. So if you love gold, if you love real money, it is maybe safer to sell your oil in renminbi. Okay? Now, now let's go back to China's digital currency. Came out two months ago. It is the ideal money for users. What is, sorry, what is the ideal money for users? Something that is acceptable to everyone. Something that's easy to use, is fast, cannot be overprinted. Ah, that's when the Chinese remain B, digital yuan, can be overprinted. It is also an artificial uh, uh, commodity. Well, people have brought up, how about Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin has such advantages. It cannot be uh, overproduced because the supply is fixed by the software. It can also be transferred easily. Okay, It is impossible to counterfeit. And the transfer fees are very low. Okay, It's between 0.5% to much less than that. Every time we transfer money through the global SWIFT payment, we have to pay between three to six percent for all our transfers. So of course, using Bitcoin will be fantastic, much cheaper. And that's the attraction. But there's a big disadvantage of using Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency for that matter. The price is very volatile. Bitcoin has shot up to 18,000 US dollars per Bitcoin, down, up, and of course the past few days it's gone up to 11,000 US dollars again. So this volatility in the Bitcoin price is not something that we all like. We want to hold currencies that are stable. And so Bitcoin as a payment system is not attractive. There is a hybrid called stablecoin, whereby they try to address this issue of volatility in the cryptocurrency. On top of that, this type of cryptocurrency, the stablecoin, is backed by a recognized asset. Okay, so stable coins gives the advantages of cryptocurrency and uh, uh, a gold standard currency. One example of a stable coin is Libra. This was uh, invented by Facebook about a year ago. It came out with Libra. But of course, when a private company comes up with a cryptocurrency or any currency, nobody likes it. Okay, uh, let's talk about Libra. Libra is backed by government securities, bonds and all that. And it's also backed by a whole range of currencies. So that's the backing of Facebook's Libra. It sounds good, it sounds attractive, but like I said, it did take off because all the central banks of the world don't want another competitor. And users like us, a lot of us have got not so much confidence in Facebook because they have used our information for their own purposes. So we don't like it. So Libra is not taking off, at least for time being. There are actually many other stable coins in this world. These are the top uh, six stable coins in the world. Uh, and they are doing very well. okay, but it's just that it is not backed by any government. So no government will want to champion it or support it. Whereas the digital yuan is totally different. It is supported by the Chinese government. Okay, so if the digital one becomes a stable coin, what will China use to back the digital, the digital yuan? 
Well, for one, gold is rare and China has been accumulating gold. How rare is gold? Let me show you. This is you and I standing at the bottom. Okay. If all the gold in the world were melted and put into a block, this gold would occupy that much space. This is all the world's platinum, and this is all the world's silver. So as you can see, gold is quite rare. Who has the world's gold? Well, China has been accumulating a lot of gold. Altogether, so far, there are about maybe about 200 tons of gold in the world. Half of it goes to your wives and lovers, okay, in the form of jewelry. Then all the central banks have only about 17% of all the gold in the world. China has 20,000, so China has 10% of basically the world's gold. 10% is a lot, actually, but uh, maybe not enough to, as a, if you want to become a monopoly. An article came out late last year which uh, struck me as quite uh, interesting. Bitcoin, you know, in the past five, ten, five years, China has been mining and accumulating a lot of Bitcoins. Or maybe not, not China, Chinese miners, okay? Of all the Bitcoins in the world, right, uh, which is about 21 million Bitcoins, China has, or Chinese miners have accumulated about 11 million bitcoins so they represent about 60 percent of the world's supply of bitcoins now if you look at it from this angle actually bitcoin is actually no different from gold gold is made by nature bitcoin is man-made but it is so far impossible to create more bitcoin so in a sense it's as good as gold and bitcoin is traded all over the world as well it's well known it's probably the first cryptocurrency that has gained prominence. So using Bitcoin and gold, China could use this two to back up their digital yuan. So the question is, if China does that, when will the US dollar be replaced? Well, China says that it will launch its digital yuan in one and a half years time. This will be in the Beijing Olympics. Winter Olympics. Will it catch on? Well, it started testing with four cities in China, which covers 38 million people. That's a lot of people. But they are now talking with two uh, apps, uh, Meituan and Didi. These are uh, the food delivery apps and the ride hailing apps. And this cover half a million users each. So it is, in a sense, the digital yuan is being tested out the whole of China at, at the same time. Now, China will, Chinese people will embrace the usage of digital yuan. I think there's no question about it. But will the world, the rest of the outside world, adopt and embrace the digital yuan? Well, for one, let's look at the advantages. It's faster and cheaper than SWIFT. Remember I told you, uh, the commissioner is maybe 0.5% or less for digital currency. And for SWIFT, it's between 3 to 6%. So if you are a businessman, or even if you are not a businessman, you're sending money to somebody in the Philippines, why do you want to pay so much in commission? So digital yuan will be popular. And of course, the COVID-19 has pushed us all into using or uh, they have encouraged us to use e-payments methods and of course it has frightened us from handling cash so we don't want to handle cash so e-payments is a safe alternative paypal became very popular because of ebay ebay had you know, a lot of, of things to buy and so paypal boom because of ebay Alipay became very popular because of Taobao, which is another website selling goods and services. So PayPal and Alipay rode on a big platform, a selling a supermarket platform, so to speak. The digital yuan will also run on a big platform, which is everything that's made in China. And that's why I believe it will catch on very easily. Now look at 
what the US has done to undermine its own US dollars. Well, it's been printing lots of money and uh, the current Fed has been doing the past few months even more. All these events are actually pushing the digital one to customers. And what the US is doing is actually sabotaging its own US dollars and pulling the US dollars away from customers. Trump's plan to this global wars, these are all deglobalization. You know, globalization helped to promote the usage of US dollar. Deglobalization will reverse it. And not only that, Trump's US has done a lot of things to withdraw from the world, from Paris Climate Agreement, right down to the latest WTO. There are all sorts of reasons for that. So is it too late for the US to make a U-turn and catch up on the digital yuan? Well, why, the question is, why did the US see the digital yuan as a threat? And you can explain it using one reason, which is the competency trap. The US is a victim of that. What is this? See, when a person or organization is successful using one method of doing things, then it sort of cuts its mind off from learning new ways of doing things. It applies to us, to companies, and to countries. For companies, one good example is Kodak. In 1975, they actually invented a digital camera. But Kodak didn't want to pursue it because they were making tons of money selling film. Okay? And it's the same. The US didn't pursue 5G because they were dominant in 4G and they had everything running for them in the, for 4G. So why bother to develop a new technology? And so China stole them much on them. But most importantly, with the emergence of the digital yuan, this will weaken the US military. This is very important. So I shall spend some time on it. We go back to the first Cold War between USSR and Russia, 1945 and 1991. What was at stake then? The question was, was a state plan economy better than a free market economy? And so in the race to prove who was better, there were actually two races. The race to the moon. Who could put a man on the moon first? Of course, we all know that the US did that. And secondly, who could come up with better, faster, more deadly missiles. So this was the missile war. All this cost money in terms of research, resources, everything. And on this score, the US had the big advantage. They had a money printing machine with them. See, they buy raw materials, you print US dollar, you pay them. Pay Australia, pay Africa for all the raw materials. The Soviet Union, they want to buy raw materials from Australia or from Africa. They have to change their rubles to US dollar before they can buy their raw materials. So the Soviet Union had a big disadvantage from the, from the word go. So it was not surprising, looking a bit at, it, at hindsight, that the US won the Cold War without a fight. The USSR just collapsed, just ran out of money. Now we are engaged in this trade war between US and China. Maybe some say two years back or more. The question now is, is a state with human rights and democracy better? Or is it a state without human rights and democracy? This is what we are, what the world is fighting over now. But it's interesting to note that in a fight against the virus, China sacrificed growth and freedom, but saves lives. USA is pro-growth, promotes personal freedom, but lives are lost. Will this Cold War, which seems to be getting hotter every day, lead to a hot war? I have three points to make about this. The first point is all this uh, attacks against China. Could it be that it's just the elections? No? Because you look at the history, 
politicians will say everything before election, right? But after they have won, they will change their tune. This has happened throughout the world. And will Trump be different? Well, it seems that Joe Biden is also, in a sense, quite anti-China. So maybe after if one of them wins, either of them wins, the attacks against China might still be there. Maybe it might be moderated. Unless, of course, we get a surprise win. Like maybe we get Kanye West winning the US election. But heaven forbid that to happen. Point number two, why is, are the US or the hardliners, the hawks, against the emergence of China? Is it due to nationalism, where you actually don't like another culture, another race to overtake you? Or is it due to the Thucydides trap, which is just you don't like another group of people to overshadow you? Hate and jealousy, are these the reasons? I'm sure part of it is the re reason behind it. After all, most of us are racists. We have very blinkered views. So I'm sure some Americans have this view that they don't want another race and another culture to overtake them. The third reason, well, we have to look at the trade between China and USSR. I mean, USSR and uh, US and US and China. In 1979, during the Cold War, trade between US and USSR was only about 1% of the total US trade. Today, it's even less. So the US and USSR, Russia, the connection is not there. Whereas between China and USA, you know, in 1979, when China just opened itself to the world, trade was about 1% of total US trade. Today, it's gone up to 636, which is about 11%. Now, this is big. I mean, you might not think 11% is big, but it is big. The US biggest trading partner is Canada, which is around 12% as well. Okay, here lies the important point. There is so much at stake between the US and China. It's just like lovers. You know, they quarrel, you know, but as long as there's great sex between them, you will never think of divorce. And so the business arrangement between the US and China seems to be so beneficial to both parties. On that score, turning the Cold War into hot war might be moderated. Anyway, my view is that I think there might not be a hot war. We'll just go on this cold, warm war for a few more years. In the meantime, the digital yuan will emerge, will grow. And if Trump continues to sabotage the US dollar by attacking the world, then of course it it's, it's, uh, undermines the US dollar and promotes the digital yuan. Today, because of what's happening in the global pandemic, all countries of the world, many countries of the world, don't want to accept US tourists. The map shows the rate shaded countries. These are the countries who say we don't want US tourists. Okay, the way things are going, this hot, warm, or cold war between US and China, sooner or later, nobody will want to US dollars as well. And so I think the end of the cold war will also be without a shot. In fact, now I think it is a war between China and USA to see who goes bankrupt first. Like I said, this is a, a lecture in aid of YWCA. So if you have your smartphones, you can whip it out and send some money to YWCA. Thank you very much.